This video is all about study biases, things that can mess up a study, a research study. And we said you can reduce the ways we mess up a research study by making sure it's randomized and by making sure it's a control group. Right? But if you don't do those, then you can mess up a, a study. I like to break the biases up into categories. This is helpful for me. If it's not helpful for you, let me know in the comment section, all right? And we'll take an example. We'll say someone is, is gonna start a new study to try out a new drug. So the first thing they do is gather a group of people, gather participants. Makes perfect sense. After they have enough participants, then they'll perform the study. And that study will generate a lot of data and you wanna interpret that data. And that's kind of what we do. Kind of what we do. And you can mess up any, any kind of stage of this. Right? You can mess up gathering your participants. One way is by not randomizing your participants. Anytime you gather participants, you want to make sure the groups are random, that they're kind of similar to each other. If groups are not random, groups not random, then we have a problem. You don't want one group to be way different than the other group, right? You don't want that. Also, if the groups are not indicative of the general population. There's something called Berkson effect, where if you recruit a, a bunch of people from the hospital, people from the hospital are not indicative of the general population. People in the hospital are really, really sick. All right, so that's not gonna translate to the general population. The opposite of that is the healthy worker effect. Well, if you recruit a bunch of 20-year-old athletes that don't have anything wrong with their health, that's not indicative of the general population. We're not all 20-year-old athletes that are just super healthy. No, that's not going to work. That's called the healthy worker effect. There's something called non-response bias. This is when the people that respond to your study differ from the people that don't respond to your study. So classic example, if you put up a poster in your college that says, hey, I'm looking for participants. I'll pay $100 every two hours. You're gonna have a ton of college people signing up because they're broke, they need that money, right? Are young college people indicative of the general population? Again, no, they're way healthier. So the people that respond differ from the people that don't respond. That's non-response bias, non response bias all right all of this can be summed up into one word selection bias name gives it away there's something wrong with how you're selecting your participants and it skews your data that is selection bias let's move on to what happens if you're performing the study and you mess up there are a couple ways you can mess up easiest one to kind of conceptually understand is procedural bias this is when you perform the study in a, in a skewed way. Maybe you give patients the wrong dose of drug or something, something where you're performing the, the study poorly, procedural bias, something around the procedure of your study. You can have measurement bias. Again, the name gives it away. Here you're not measuring the data correctly or you're measuring it poorly. Maybe, maybe the machine you're using is broken and it generates a number that doesn't really correlate to anything. That's a measurement bias. So you're measuring things poorly, incorrectly. A subcategory of this is the Hawthorne effect. This is when patients change when observed. For example, you wanna try a new anti-pain medication. And a patient is in 10 out of 10 pain, but they don't wanna tell you they're 10 out of 10. Yeah, they don't want to look weak. They don't want to look weak when they're being observed, so they might say, oh, this is six out of 10. Doesn't that change your measurement? Measurement bias, that's the Hawthorne effect. Patients change when they're being observed. You have something called recall bias. This happens when you try to re, this occurs when patients try to recall something try and go back in their memory and sometimes that can be skewed or sometimes that can be incorrect altogether. Classic example, we didn't know for a while that asbestos caused cancer. Right, so if you ask these people, have they ever been in a shipyard, ever been exposed to roofing asbestos, they'll be like, no, no, never had. 
Now that we do know asbestos causes cancer, people that have mesothelioma, if you ask them now, have you ever been in a shipyard? They'll be like, yeah, 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 I, I totally remember. Back in uh, 1946, I was in a shipyard. Can you really rely on that? Could that be recall bias? Where they're recalling something that may or may not happen? That's recall bias. You can have something called attrition bias. Again, the name gives it away. People are lost in follow-up, attrition. People are lost in follow-up. So you have 50 people that you experimented on, 50 people that didn't. All right, so those people, all 50 of the people that you didn't experiment on, you, you follow up, they give you all their information, give you all the data, perfect. The 50 people that you did experiment on, you lose 49 of them to follow up. You only have one person left, and they tell you that drug you gave them was horrible, it caused all these side effects. Can you trust that one person? Who knows, maybe the other 49 love that drug. You can't really trust them. You're lost, you lose a ton of people in follow-up, so lose the follow-up. That's attrition bias. That is attrition bias. You have something called observer bias, where the observer, the researcher, is biased. So if you have a study that wants to see what percentage of radiologists can pick up lung cancer on a chest x-ray, if the observer, if the researcher knows that a patient has lung cancer, they're gonna look extra, extra hard on that chest x-ray. If they know that patient doesn't have lung cancer, they won't even look at it. If the observer is biased in any way that can affect your study, that is observer bias. You can have observer Expectancy bias, name gives it away. The observer, the researcher, is expecting a result. Maybe the observer really, really wants this drug to work. They're expecting this drug to work. So any positive outcome, they document it right away. Any negative outcome, oh, they kind of shoot it away. Maybe that's not st st statistically significant. You know what, we're not gonna list that. Observer expectancy bias. And our last one we're gonna talk about is Susceptibility bias. People that are more susceptible to disease, people that are sicker, if you give these people that are sicker a little bit extra medication, that can affect your results. Susceptibility bias. So hopefully you can see by now, the name really gives it away. If you're ever stuck, if they ever give you an example on the test and you're not quite sure, look at the answer choices, look at the name, and oftentimes the name can help guide you, okay? That's things, biases that can occur when you perform a study. How about biases that can occur when you interpret data? You can have something called lead time bias, where early detection of a disease is confused with increased survival. What the heck does that even mean? Let's say you have a disease that without fail kills people within 20 years. So if you get the disease when you're 20, without fail, you will die when you're 40. Now, researchers don't know this, don't know about this disease. So they develop a, a test to try and pick it up. And their most sensitive test picks it up when they're 35. Picks it up. And they say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Anytime we pick it up, people die within five years of this, dis of this disease. And then another researcher comes along and says, I made a more sensitive test. Picks it up when they're 30. They say, you're wrong. When we pick it up, patients die within 10 years. Can you see what the problem is? They can only see a part of the picture. They think, hey, we picked it up when they're 30. We are increasing survivability by five years. They're not, they're just picking up earlier, but without fail, whether or not you pick it up early or pick it up late, the disease kills you in 20. All right, that's lead time bias, where an early detection of a disease makes you think there's increased survivability when there isn't. Late look bias is another one. What the heck is late look bias? It's when your results are too late to, to be any good. So let's think of an example about HIV. People with very severe HIV, probably dead. Probably dead. You can't do an experiment with them because they don't exist anymore. So let's say you find a group of people with HIV and they all seem kind of mild and you think to yourself, hey, HIV, they have kind of mild symptoms, kind of a mild course not knowing that the severe people with HIV are all dead. That's late look bias. 
And the last one I want to talk about is confounding bias. To confound something is to, to kind of mix things up. To mix things up so that the individual parts are difficult to discern. A lot of times we want so bad for A to equal B. We want so bad, so bad for, for A to equal B. For, let's say, a coal, coal exposure to equal lung cancer. We want it so bad. And sometimes our, our research shows this and we're like, oh yes, we found the link, we found the link. Not knowing that A does not equal B. Not knowing that A does not equal B. In fact, there's some sort of outside factor that we didn't attribute, that we didn't discover. And that is actually equal to it. That is the actual factor that we didn't find. So in our example, we really, really wanted coal exposure to cause lung cancer. Not knowing that it didn't, it just so happens that coal workers smoked more and that's what caused lung cancer. Some outside factor that we didn't account for. That is confounding bias. All right. Those are your biases. I hope that clears things up. Hope those examples made sense. And more importantly, if you're ever stuck, look at the names. The names often give it away. Names often give it away. Last topic I want to talk about is things that aren't biases that might look like biases. One of them is called generalization. This is when you take a study and you can apply it to a different population. All right, so a really, a really, really good study that has randomized participants, controlled participants, you can extrapolate that to a general population if the study's good enough. That's called generaliz generalization, not a bias. We do it all the time. There's something called effect modification. Effect modification. When we talked about confounding bias, we talked about how we really, really wanted A to equal B. But in reality, they didn't equal each other. There was instead an outside force that we didn't see, and that is what caused B. That's confounding bias. Effect modification is a little bit different. Effect modification, we find that A does equal B, and that that outside force may increase the risk or decrease the risk, but A equals B regardless. So an example of effect modification would be asbestos causes cancer. Asbestos causes cancer. Smoking increases the risk of cancer if you have asbestos exposure, but it doesn't change the relationship. No matter if you're smoking or you're not smoking, asbestos causes cancer, asbestos causes cancer. Doesn't change the relationship. It just modifies the effect. Right. If it changed the relationship, then it's no longer effect modification, then it's a confounding bias. Hope that clarifies some things. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.